Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be carrying on with the series about the Gilded Age families of America, and this time we're going to be talking about the Rockefeller family. This is the first family that will be covered in this series that is still wealthy and prominent to this day, and that actually turned out to be not a good thing in terms of the research. This video is coming out a little bit late because I had difficulty finding information about the more recent generations of this family, and I'm going to get into why I think that was in a little bit. You'll also notice that I'm no longer in my closet. I've left my internship. It ended. There was no, I, I didn't leave in disgrace or anything. And now I am back in school and everything is normal, so I'm back in my bedroom now. So let's get stuck in there with the Rockefellers. The family can be traced back to Johann Peter Rockefeller, 1681 to 1763 who emigrated from the Rhineland to Pennsylvania in 1723 or thereabouts. There's very little information floating about about what Johann Peter Rockefeller did with his life. I was able to find out that he bought a plantation in Somerville, New Jersey, but what was grown at that plantation and whether or not that plantation was run on slave labor, I cannot say. The Rockefellers did not seem to do anything of significance for approximately 100 years after they got to the United States, until William Avery Rockefeller, 1810 to 1906, also known as Devil Bill, came onto the scene. Devil Bill was a rather seedy individual, as is evidenced by his occupation section on Wikipedia, which lists him as a businessman, lumberman, herbalist, and snake oil salesman. When he was fleecing vulnerable people out of their money, he went under the alias of Dr. William Livingston. Devil Bill used his snake oil profits to invest in land and eventually became a banker of sorts, but like a, a really shady one, more shady than regular bankers are. If I have any bankers watching, no offense. So what he would do is loan money to farmers at an interest rate of around 12%. Now that's a little high for the time, but it's not outside the realm of normalcy and, and possibility. Where it became shady was that he would only loan money to farmers whom he thought would not be able to pay back the loans. This would allow him to foreclose upon their land. Devil Bill married his first wife, Eliza, in 1837. They had five children, Lucy, John D., William A. Jr., and Frank. Frank had a twin sister, Frances, who died at the age of two. Devil Bill kept true to his character as being not a very good person when he said, and I quote, I cheat my boys every chance I get. I want to make him sharp. Devil Bill also fathered two bastard children by his housekeeper, Nancy Brown. Their names were Clorinda and Cordelia, and they were born in 1838 and 1840, respectively. Their dates of birth are unknown. It is said that Devil Bill was in love with Nancy Brown, but he didn't marry her because he was poor. His wife, Eliza, came with a $500 dowry, so he married her instead. What a gentleman. Devil Bill abandoned his family when his three eldest children were still teenagers, but he remained legally married to Eliza until her death. In 1856, under his false name of William Livingston, Devil Bill bigamously married a woman named Margaret Allen. Fortunately, the two did not have any children to complicate the matter further. And if you're wondering why Devil Bill abandoned his family, it wasn't just run-of-the-mill sleaziness. No, in 1849, Devil Bill was convicted of raping one Anne Vanderbeek at gunpoint. Or, as the court said, he did violently and against her will, feloniously did ravish and carnally know her. Devil Bill was released on a bail of $1,175, which was paid by his father-in-law. As soon as he was out of jail, he promptly skipped town. His father-in-law sued him to recover his money, but at this point, he couldn't be found. Not even his wife knew where he was at this point. You know, his, his real wife, his first wife, Eliza. He died on May 11th, 1906. John D. Rockefeller never publicly acknowledged his father's bigamy. Neither did he pay for his father's gravestone. The cost for the stone was taken out of the inheritance of Devil Bill's second bigamous wife. For the purposes of this video, Devil Bill's sons are his only important children. We will cover each of them, beginning with Frank, the youngest. He joined the 7th Ohio Infantry in 1861 when he was just 16 years old. After the Civil War, he held various jobs around Cleveland and eventually became involved in Standard Oil, the company that his brothers had founded. He remained involved in Standard Oil until 1898 when he had a falling out with his brothers. I have not been able to determine the exact cause of this falling out, but it does appear to have been business related. That being said, there were probably a lot of deep-seated childhood jealousies and and wounds that were coming to the surface as well. 
Frank Rockefeller moved to Kansas, where he lost around $750,000 on bad investments, although he eventually found stability when he invested in the Buckeye Steel Castings Company. He never spoke with his brothers again. One year before he died, his brother William attempted to reconcile with him, but Frank Rockefeller said, quote, there is not the slightest possibility of a reconciliation. He died in 1917. I've not been able to find an estimation of his net worth, and although he was wealthy, he was almost certainly not as wealthy as his brother John. He married Helen Elizabeth Schofield in 1870. They had five children, Alice Maud, Anna Beatrice, William Schofield, Helen Effie, and Myra. It appears that Alice Maud never married. Anna Beatrice married a man named William Nash in 1909. They had one daughter named Helen E. Nash. The only information I've been able to find out about her is that her married name was Ingram. Helen Effie Rockefeller married a man named William Scott Bowler. They had one child named Franklin Rockefeller Bowler. He married twice, but does not appear to have had any children. The other children of Frank and Helen Rockefeller died too young to be married. On to John D. Rockefeller. He was born in 1839 and is widely considered to have been the wealthiest person to have ever lived on earth, although not necessarily in terms of money, which I know is confusing, so allow me to explain. At the time of his death in 1937, John D. Rockefeller was worth around $1.4 billion. Adjusted for inflation, that's around $30 billion today. Currently, Elon Musk is the world's richest person, with an estimated net worth of around $234 billion. Now, obviously, that is a lot larger than John D. Rockefeller's net worth, even adjusted for inflation. But one must take into account the United States GDP. At the time of his death, John D. Rockefeller's net worth accounted for 1.5% of the United States GDP. Today, 1.5% of the United States GDP is approximately $350 billion. That's roughly $115 billion less money than Elon Musk has. So therefore, when you think of it in terms of percentage of GDP, John D. Rockefeller was the wealthiest man to have ever lived. John D. Rockefeller involved himself in various money-making pursuits from the age of 15, but it wasn't until he founded Standard Oil in 1870 that he started to become truly, insanely filthy rich. Not long after he'd founded it, Rockefeller had expanded Standard Oil to be the most profitable oil refinery in all of Ohio. To give you an example of how sudden and extreme this takeover was, in a four-month period in 1872, Standard Oil absorbed 22 of its 26 Cleveland-based competitors. This was later called the Cleveland Massacre. This growth would be exponential. By the end of the 1870s, Standard Oil was refining 90% of the oil in the United States. Needless to say, by this point, Rockefeller had already become a millionaire. One of the tricks that Standard Oil used in its quest for world domination was that of selling its products at or below cost. The company was big enough that it could absorb the loss, at least for a limited amount of time. Its smaller competitors wouldn't be able to, so they were priced out of the market. Once Standard Oil had a monopoly, they could raise the prices as much as they wanted. This monopoly was not viewed with kindness at the time. In 1880, the magazine The New York World observed that, quote, Standard Oil is the most cruel, impudent, pitiless, and grasping monopoly that ever fastened upon a country. Rockefeller responded to this article by saying, In a business so large as ours, some things are likely to be done of which we cannot approve. We correct them as soon as they come to our knowledge. Which seems, in my opinion, to rather miss the point. In 1879, Rockefeller was actually indicted by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for monopoly. This was illegal. And this indictment prompted many similar court cases throughout the 1880s. These court cases seemed to weigh very heavily on Rockefeller, who commented later, and I quote, All the fortune that I have made has not served to compensate me for the anxiety of that period. My heart absolutely bleeds for him. By the 1890s, Standard Oil star had begun to wane just a little bit. Although roughly 85% of the world's oil was coming from the United States at that time, and Although Rockefeller was refining 90% of that oil that came from the United States, oil fields in Europe and Asia were starting to pose some more serious competition. Additionally, by the 1890s, electricity was starting to become a major competitor to kerosene. In fact, it was even starting to supersede it. That meant that one of Standard Oil's biggest and most profitable products was beginning to fade into obsolescence. To compensate for this slight wane in profits, 
Rockefeller expanded his business into the refinement and transportation of iron ore. This put him into direct competition with Andrew Carnegie, who has been the subject of his own video on this channel. I'll link it in the cards. Also, at this point in time, Rockefeller took public transportation to work every day. I didn't know where else to put this in the video, but I thought it was kind of cool and I wanted to put it in. It kind of reminds me of Joe Biden taking the Amtrak to work every day when he was a senator. In 1904, Rockefeller and Standard Oil drew the attention of Ida Tarbell, who was a leading muckrucking journalist of the time. She wrote a book called The History of the Standard Oil Company, and this book was not flattering. It exposed many of the shady dealings in which Rockefeller had partaken in order to attain his success. Tarbell stated, quote, I never had any animus against their size or their wealth never objected to their corporate form. I was willing that they should combine and grow to be as big and wealthy as they could, but only by legitimate means. But they had never played fair, and that ruined all their greatness for me." Rockefeller responded to this book by saying that he would hear, quote, "...not a word about that misguided woman." The book, however, did inspire Rockefeller to attempt to redeem the reputation of Standard Oil and his own reputation in the public eye. His attempts do not appear to have been very successful. There are many more business practices and scandals and money-making endeavors and philanthropic endeavors in which John D. Rockefeller engaged, but I feel like recounting them would just get kind of tedious. You get the point. So let's move on to his personal life. In 1864, Rockefeller married Laura Celestia Superman. Wait, that can't be right. Laura Celestia Superman? That's got to be a typo. Christ on a cracker, Laura Celestia Spellman. He seems to have respected her quite highly. Later in life, he is quoted as saying, her judgment was always better than mine. Without her keen advice, I would be a poor man. In 1913, he built Kaikut, I think. It's a Dutch word and Dutch words are famously not possible to pronounce. It's a Brobdingnagian mansion, not far from Sleepy Hollow in New York. It's still the home of the Rockefeller family today, although much of the grounds of the estate have been donated to the state of New York. Obviously, to the state of New York. It'd be kind of funny if they donated the grounds to a different state, wouldn't it? Like, they donate them to Maine, even though they're in New York. <laughs> okay, Mr. and Mrs. John D. Rockefeller had five children. For the purposes of this video, the only one who matters is his one and only son, John D. Rockefeller Jr., a very creative name I know, so we're going to ignore all of the other five. John D. Rockefeller Jr., we're just going to call him Jr. in this video, was born in 1874 and he died in 1960. He joined his father's business in 1897. There was also some cross-pollination going on because at this time he was also working as the director of J.P. Morgan's U.S. Steel Company. But Jr. really considered himself to be a philanthropist, so in 1910 he stopped working so as to better pursue his philanthropic endeavors. In fairness, Jr. did give away a lot of money, about $537 million over the course of his lifetime. It would take an age to list all of the charities he endowed, so let's just say that there were a lot of them and leave it at that. But he was not free of his scandals as well. There is one that really stands out in the annals of history. In 1913, the United Mine Workers of America called for a strike against the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, in which Jr. held a 40% interest. In 1914, after a long period of unrest, strike breakers killed 20 men, women, and children in what would later come to be known as the Ludlow Massacre. Although Jr. did not expressly order the massacre, Historians do tend to agree that he was mostly to blame for the violence. And it isn't just historians who blame Junior. He was also blamed at the time. In 1915, Margaret Sanger, yes, that Margaret Sanger, wrote in her magazine, The Woman Rebel, quote, Remember Ludlow. Remember the men, women, and children who were sacrificed in order that John D. Rockefeller Jr. might continue his noble career of charity and philanthropy as a supporter of the Christian faith. One would think that this article would mark the end of any further working relationship between Margaret Sanger and Jr. But one would be wrong because about 10 years later, he donated money to Sanger's American Birth Control League. Jr. married Abigail Green Aldrich in 1901 in a wedding that was largely described as being one of the most lavish of the age. She died in 1948, and a couple years later, he remarried a woman named Martha Baird. When Junior died, half of his fortune went to her. The other half went to the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, a charitable organization that is based out of New York. I haven't been able to figure out what happened to Martha Baird's money after she died, but one can only assume that because she didn't have any children of her own, the money went to her stepchildren, Rockefeller's children with his first wife, Abigail. 
This line is still alive and kicking today. However, I have been able to find next to no information about any of them. Under my JP Morgan video, I had some people commenting that rich people can pay money to essentially have their names and details scrubbed from the internet. And perhaps that's what happened here because it's shocking how little information I can find about this branch of the family. But I do know that they're still around and they are still ridiculously wealthy. If you do have any specific information, please leave it commented down below because my naturally curious nature is taking over and I do want to know more about them. I just watch, somebody's gonna comment. Um, actually, there's a very, very famous and well-known article that exactly specifies everything you wanted to know. <sighs> I'm not saying I'm infallible. I just wasn't able to find anything. John D. Rockefeller had another brother. Unfortunately, the life of William Rockefeller Jr is not nearly so well documented as that of his brother John D. I have not been able to find an estimation of his net worth, however we do know that he was rolling in it due to the fact that this was his house. In 1864 he married Elmira Geraldine Goodsell, and the couple had six children, about whom I was able to find only the most bare-bones information. About their children I was able to find even less information. The bones were very, very bare by that point. Either this branch of the family is just not very interesting or the internet has been scrubbed of the juicy details. In 2020, Forbes estimated that the Rockefeller family collectively has a net worth of around $8.4 billion. So while they're not nearly as wealthy as their 19th century forebearers, they are still absolutely insanely absurdly wealthy. This is the first family I've covered in this series that is still wealthy today, and I think that's why I've been having so much trouble finding information about them. Now again, if you have any more information about the Rockefellers today, and sort of like since 1950, I would really appreciate it. And again, I know that there's gonna be somebody who's gonna come along and say, there's this, there's this article, and it says everything you need to know, and I found it in like 30 seconds of searching. <sighs> such is the way of the world. So I'm sorry that this video doesn't have an incredibly satisfying conclusion. This series is about figuring out what the robber baron families are doing today, and we didn't really get much information about what the Rockefellers are doing today other than they're still rich. This video was a little bit late because I was trying to find information about them. I was, I was dragging the research process out trying to find some satisfying conclusions, but I just couldn't. So my apologies. A huge, huge thank you to Mary Royal, Sandra White, Emily Donnelly, V. Birchwood, Neves Cabara, Kiara Craft, Amanda Martin, Heather C., Mary Mead, and Chelsea Ross for sponsoring this channel on Patreon. If you would also like to sponsor this channel on Patreon, there will be a link down below. Please do not feel pressured. No hard feelings if you can't. I get it. Money's tight. Uh, however, there will be hard feelings if you don't follow me on Instagram, which will also be linked below because that's free. I'm also going to leave my email down below in case you need to get in touch with me for any reason. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and share this video, and stick around until next time. I'm sorry, I, uh, it, uh, <laughs> stick around until next time. I've got an exciting video planned for mid-September. Bye-bye.